thank you for that warm reception. <laughs> it's very interesting that uh, our subject this morning should deal with conserving energy resources, because I just ran out of some. <laughs> so I'm going to listen attentively to my lecture and see if I can prove myself as I go along. If you can't hear, let us know, and, and Gilbert will raise the microphone. I'm trying to save myself from laryngitis. This morning, we do have an interesting theme, and that has to do with the conserving of the basic energy resources of the human being. Uh, Paracelsus von Hohenheim, as a result of his studies in Constantinople, received from the Arab physicians and philosophers the astronomical concept that there are three suns in our solar system. The one that at the small end is the one we see. There are two others making a triad, and the planets revolve around the entire group. Of, one of, of these suns, one is visible and two are invisible. One provides energy to the forms and bodies of things, and the other two supply energy to the invisible parts of nature not only of nature around us, but human nature within ourselves. The human being has, according to this concept, three basic sources of energy. One of these sources is his spiritual sun, the divine principle of universal energy, which is disseminated throughout all time and space. The second is a kind of soul energy, that it develops the various faculties, parts, and members of the human personality. The uh, soul energy has as its disseminating uh, processes the planets which revolve about the sun. The planets become the differentiators of thought, emotion, vitality, all kinds of specialized forms of energy usage, and finally also energy depletion. The third source of this energy works upon the physical forms of things and is so more or less represented by that great battery which we call the planet Earth. Uh, to the ancients, the Earth was a reservoir of energies. It was the container upon which all energies converge to be transformed into the processes of form building. The energy of the Earth is physical. It has to do with the growth and structure of physical processes in nature. It therefore may be regarded as the source of nutrition. Nutrition being basically a dissemination of physical energy over the field of its own activities, namely physical forms in life. Also, the physical energy takes charge of the actions and locomotions of things. It has to do with the growth of plants. It has to do with the gradual development of forms and their maintenance throughout nature. And the highest form of this uh, energy, of course, is interrelated with some of the higher forms in the processes of generation or the reproduction of species. Another point that is, I think, very interesting to consider, and that is that part of the solar rays reaching the Earth uh, by a uh, bounce from the surface of the moon. So the moon becomes a kind of subsidiary source of energy. But its energy is a very peculiar and particular kind. Through the old Arabs and Persians, the lunar energy was the source of psychic phenomena. In other words, it is the source of that kind of energy resource that is used in magic, sorcery, and many types of esoteric disciplines and doctrines. The tendency, however, of the lunar force is to be disintegrative. It has a tendency to uh, break down more than it can produce, and also to lead into fantasy and phantoms. The moon is the magic mirror of antiquity in which all the processes of nature are more or less mirrored and in terms of magic, sorcery, 
metaphysical activities of all kinds. Now these types of activities result in a combination of circumstances. The activities themselves call upon energy resources. The activities called upon under such conditions are not part of the straight growth in nature. Therefore it is necessary uh, to recognize a conflict between the natural processes of growth and the processes of psychic phenomena. Now this does not mean that this phenomena is not genuine. It means, however, that it is, it is peculiarly subject to fantasy. It is nocturnal. It has to do with the strange creatures of dreams, fantasy, magic, and to a certain deg degree, psychology. Psychology has really, somewhere along the line, to pause and solve the mystery of the effect of the moon upon the psychological integration of the human being. This is a very important point but as yet comparatively unnoticed. Yet if you go through the old mythologies, you go through the old imageries, you find very often a lunar crescent uh, tied into the hair of the god Shiva or one of the other ancient deities. Not simply because it is a humid principle, but because it is a principle of fascination, a principle that was caught, captured by the Greeks and the goddess Diana, the huntress and in many other religious symbols and systems. Now the human being, being as he is, a composite of the elements of the solar system, is constituted very much like the solar system in his principles. He, uh, if we can completely study his magnetic field and the entire auric structure behind the body, we will see that we are in the presence of a little solar system as Bambi pointed out, the whole solar system is located or is epitomized in the human structure. Therefore, there is a spiritual source of energy in man, which corresponds to the first of the three invisible suns. There is a mystical or vital force, a secondary sun, invisible, corresponding to the soul. In this man is also equipped. Then there is the physical sun in man, by means of which all of the body functions are maintained within his own structure, much as in the same way as in the solar system itself. The three suns in man are the heart, the brain, and the reproductive center. And these are the principal administrators of energy. There is also a psychic field associated with the solar plexus, which again becomes the counterpart of the lunar influence. All of these factors taken into consideration would form a very interesting study, and it's more or less of a pity that uh, modern thinkers haven't recognized the dramatic importance of trying to investigate the invisible. Locked within the visible, and yet at the same time fully aware that the visible is suspended from something they cannot see. Too many learned persons simply discard the possibility of making the parallels which might be of the greatest value in solving human problems. Actually, our problem this morning is essentially how are we going to use these energies? We have therefore three legitimate forms of energy that we have to use, and one doubtful form. We have a spiritual energy which, of course, actually is available to us in only one way, and that way is through the complete harmonization of the structure which, of which we are composed. Spiritual energy can only manifest on its own level. Therefore, it can only manifest in organisms in which all factors or circumstances that are contrary to spirit have been overcome or eliminated. Therefore, it becomes a pure supporter of man's most vital, invisible, un unknown factor, his own spirit. The spirit is not only the source of his life, but it is also the central point from which the energy of his life is uh, suspended. Therefore, the spiritual sun being the highest, manifesting through a triad of energy factors, becomes the source 
of all energy and is related to the cosmic and space energy in its largest and most abstract fields. Now the secondary is the which you might call the rational energies. These have to do with the mind, with the development of the body, with the laws and rules governing knowledge, with the expansion of arts and sciences, and the supporting of ideals, convictions, integrities. And here is where we have one of our major difficulties. We have within the individual the possibility of using these energies as he himself chooses to use them. As a result of that, these energies are often in conflict. And where this conflict exists, it becomes a major factor in the depletion of the physical resources of the individual. The conflicts between attitudes, then, uh, become one of the major sources of the depletion of the energy which maintains the human being on the level of the human being. It is therefore very important that each individual reconcile the parts of himself. He must uh, reunite a sort of family relationship. He must get away from the push and pull of conflicting pressures which are due to conflicting ambitions, attitudes, and emphases on the various levels of his skills, his ideals, and his integrities. Uh, the individual whose convictions are not supported by his conduct, for instance, is bound to be in trouble. He is bound to deplete his energy resources. He destroys them. He, he creates toxins in them. He pollutes them as air could be, or water can be polluted. It is therefore most important that the individual shall overcome the negative pressures of his own mental emotional focus. Now many people today are making quite a project out of becoming spiritual. They hope very much that they're going to be able to transcend the limitations and problems of daily living. Very many of these people, however, are not doing too well. One of the main reasons is that they have not placed a proper censorship upon their own conduct. Individuals who are seeking spiritual integrities and spiritual values cannot compromise the ordinary affairs of life. The individual who is still seeking power, seeking wealth, seeking superiority, desiring of, to join a kind of spiritual aristocracy by which he is better than ordinary mortals, this type of person is not gaining anything from his efforts to be spiritual. No amount of disciplines, no amount of dedications can overcome weaknesses of conduct. The main, the main point always is to build conduct, to bring the energy fields into balance and to conserve all resources so that energy is available for the highest possible purposes so that this energy is available almost completely for the unfoldment, discipline, and growth of the higher nature itself. Whereas mo where most of this energy is still used in bickering and conflicts in the personal life and on the personal level of action, there cannot be very much a central spirituality floating around. Now the energy that's getting into, the tr into trouble is largely emotional energy. It is the energy of the second sun. It is the energy of the emotional, mental being, therefore very largely of what we would term the individuality. It is this type of energy that is the person as we know it today. And it is this person that is in trouble. And this person remains in trouble as long as he attempts to advance his personality and his personal purposes without consideration for his integrity. People come to me quite frequently with these problems. One of the most common, of course, is the individual who is trying desperately to be spiritual and has kindly come to the conclusion that by some circumstance, membership of something of this nature, he has finally found that superiority. He has finally found what others seek in vain, and that is the possibility of a unique attainment in spiritual growth. He is going to be better than other people, wiser, more wonderful. He is going to have a strange superiority over everything else. In other words, he is bound toward an achievement 
of spiritual aristocracy. He wishes to be an arist aristocrat in the celestial kingdom. This is not possible. It is a deadly mistake and a terrible waste of energy. The uh, Zen people are much wiser in this. They realize that energy that is held in suspension and therefore is not motivating any destructive action is the most important energy of all. The energy that we use is mostly abused, but the energy that we hold in a transitional state, that we hold in a suspension, is available but not necessarily used until it is needed. So all energy should be stored, not wasted. But when the time comes when it should be used, it should be used fully and uh, adequately. We need all available energy with which to grow. We need all available energy to serve our brother man. We own, own so little in this world that our energy is not to be directed upon our possessions, but upon the improvement of the society to which we belong. All selfishness ends in a short circuit in the energy fields of the human body. Every abuse of energy has its karmic consequence, and karma is largely a matter of compensation for abuse. Whereas if the individual does not break the rules, he does not have to worry about the karmic reactions. But karmic reactions are always punishment for broken rules. And we need to bear this in mind constantly, because in an effort to misuse the purposes for which we were intended, uh, we get into very serious complications. One of the most uncomplicated thinkers in all time, I guess, was Confucius. Confucius was perfectly aware of what constituted a superior person. This superior person was a completely self-disciplined person. But he was not disciplined in a way that showed as discipline. He wasn't unkind to himself. He did not flagellate himself literally or symbolically. He did not become a dis an austere, detached, antisocial character. The Confucian superior man was a perfectly adjusted person, not a person who was subject to various types of um, over-discipline or over-self-control. Uh, Confucius enjoyed life. He regretted that other scholars did not rise to cooperate in the reformation of China, but he did what he could, and he became uh, notable for a very sincere, superior kind of living. In the recent regimes in China, he was cast aside as ancient and uh, outlived and outworn. In the last five years, however, he has come back to become probably the ideal of Chinese character, namely perfect poise, integrity, warm sympathy, but everything under control, nothing getting away, no temper fits, no outbursts, no revenges, uh, no hatreds, no bickerings, no slanders, no effort to revenge or retaliate for real or imaginary wrongs but quietly and serenely to live according to the three principles. To do this is therefore to conserve all resources to the greatest possible degree. We will not waste energy if we control ourselves without it being necessary to use energy to control ourselves. This is the difficulty. We put an iron fist on ourselves. We lock ourselves with a tremendous effort of the will as in the case of trying to break a bad habit. But the energy that we use to get over the bad habit is almost as detrimental in its usages as the habit was. The thing is that we relax away from anything that is not right. We do not fight for a certain attitude. We, ra we relax away from that which interferes with that attitude. Uh, it is like Socrates and his statue. He, was, he told his friends that he got a block of marble, 
and then he cut away that part of the marble which didn't belong and didn't seem to work very well. And when he got all through trimming the marble, he had the statue. Now, it is made much this way of taking the rough uh, granite of our own nature. Instead of trying to dream all the time about uh, the great artistry we are going to achieve, if we just could chip away the parts that are not necessary, if we chip away the mistakes, if we just simply quietly go about doing the things that are right, if we remove that which is unnecessary, unreasonable, unfair, uh, dishonest or dishonorable, just re removing these things one at a time when we get through, the statue in all its beauty stands revealed to us. The real self is that which is revealed when the not-self is overcome. And the not-self is overcome not by fighting it, but by outgrowing it, by living above it, not with strain and effort, but with a very gentle, quiet way of doing things. It is perfectly possible to be true to yourself, uh, to fight the good fight, so-called, and to live a good and enlightened life without a great mass of conflicts. Uh, I know, for instance, that uh, in families now, there are tremendous conflicts in which uh, individuals resent each other, in which the family situation is falling apart, and uh, hard feeling is brought in the land in almost all homes. The only answer to the situation is that all this bad feeling does not add up to anything. The only answer to it is that each individual must ultimately come to the point where he recognizes the need to conserve energy by wasting none of it on dissension. And therefore, in a quiet and pleasant way, he adjusts to that which is necessary, and he quietly steps aside against that which is unnecessary. He does all that it is supposed he should do. He does not walk out on a duty. He does not avoid a responsibility. He does not reject a lesson, but he accepts all of these things quietly and with dignity. This was the code of Francis de Assis, and it is a very difficult code to excel. But it is also the code by means of which energy is, is restored. Energy is saved. Energy is guarded by this type of thing. Now, the if next phase of the energy is that every attitude that we have has some type of a reflex on the body itself. Every temper fit does much more than upset us emotionally. It upsets the body chemistry. Every mistake that we make in the personality, every act of violence, every uh, joining into riots, into uh, uh, violence against society, everything of this kind, accomplishes no good primarily, but also damages the person who is guilty of it. Now, people will say, well, there are 100,000 people that don't like something and are fighting it. Probably true. But the moment you join that group, you will begin to destroy yourself. And each of those that is in that group is destroying themselves rather than achieving their ends. And if we look around us today to see what violence is producing, we see that it produces nothing but violence. And that violence in our personal lives, whether it's intellectual or physical, produce nothing but distress. So with all of these emotional pressures, jealousy and vanity and self-centeredness and rejection of the common experiences of life, mistakes of this kind interfere with health. They begin to break down the body chemistry because the body itself, like the body of the solar system, is an outlet, a means for the expression of energy. And when the body is corrupted, the flow of energy is disturbed. The moment the flow of energy is disturbed, various types of obstruction arise. And wherever obstruction arises in the human body, death sets in. Obstruction is tension. Tension arises from the misuse of energy. And wherever it exists, it must in every possible way be relaxed. Now, most people who come and talk to you about these things say, Yes, they would be very happy to relax the energy, get rid of the tension, and do all these things if other people would agree with them. Uh, everyone would be able to live beautifully if somebody else wasn't interfering. But there is always a person or a circumstance that is nagging. 
And this con consequence forces the individual to build up these defenses of tension and stress. This is entirely erroneous. The more tension there is on the outside, the more need there is for complete internal passivity, a peace. Now, a peace also suggests a number of other things. One, how to, where to find it. Well, that is curing itself pretty much these days. There's no place you can go. The, there is no place where you can be sure that peace is going to stay very long. Uh, there is no security in human society today. Perhaps the first lesson this teaches us is to get over the idea of escaping. Now, we do still have certain monastic re escapes, certain retreats and places of this kind, and somewhere in the midst of the distant mountains we find uh, hermits who have left society to cultivate their own detachments. But for the most part, all of these people have weakened themselves by these attitudes. There is no way of gaining a position in life where relaxation is available without personal effort. There is no relaxation unless the individual makes the changes within himself. If he makes these changes within himself, relaxation is possible wherever he is. There's the old story about the Tibetan priests who do their meditation at the, while uh, surrounding a great bell that gongs all the time to disturb them, and they don't even hear it. You do not actually shut out uh, the sounds around you or the pressures. You simply solve them by, by dissolving them in quietude. Quietude doesn't mean you accept what you do not believe or compromise anything. But quietude gives you the perfect calmness with which to make the simple decision of right and wrong, the simple solution to the problem without dramatization or emotionalization, comes as the result of internal quietude. And internal quietude is the thing that helps to protect energy resources within yourself. Without this internal quietude, your energy resources cannot be adequately preserved. Now, another problem that then comes along, of course, is that the body, with its energies, has a few remarks to make and a few contributions to this problem. Today, for example, we have more people health conscious in this country than probably ever before in history. <coughs> and I think it is safe to say we have more sick people. <laughs> I read not long ago that we have 80 million people in this country reducing of whom 40 million are doing it wrong. We have people who are doing everything they can possibly do, but what are the motives? Uh, the motives to uh, various forms of health have to be very carefully considered. Unless the motive for reduction is more than merely cosmetic, it is really very uh, much a mistake. Because the real reason of all things is to protect and preserve health. And that which is not necessary to the protection and preservation of health is not a worthy occupation for the health seeker. All kinds of extreme methods are being used, mostly in an effort to compensate for extreme delinquencies. Uh, we have people who have followed up to 200 different diets. Some of them, of course, we'll never know what happened because they didn't last through the 200 diets. Around the middle of the list, they passed out. But of course, having passed out, uh, they issued no affidavit or made no statement to discourage others. They just all kept on going. The problem with health, again, is energy uh, preservation and protection. The purpose of food, which is derived largely from this great battery, which we call the earth, the energy of food is to maintain and protect life. Any form of uh, nutrition uh, which does not essentially fulfill this need is not necessary or advantageous. Many people eat all kinds of things that make them miserable in an effort to accomplish some cosmetic result. This is not the answer. If the person understands life, 
if the person comes into direct contact with the rules of the game, he will naturally and of his own accord keep those rules. But if they are forced upon him by others, or he is lured into them by ulterior motives, then this is not true. So in the matter of maintaining the physical health, again, the, the physical health depends upon the quietude of the body and the fact that the body does that which it was created to do. The body has a purpose. If that purpose is fulfilled, the body is happy. But if the body is made uh, the object of too much concern, it becomes embarrassed and begins to result in, in defects of health. The body should be left very quietly to the fulfillment of its own needs. And uh, on one occasion, Plato referred to a young dude in the Athenian column, colony, uh, Alcibiades. He said, here we have a red dagger in a jeweled sheath. We have a body that is just the body of a fop a body that is covered with the finest raiments and the greatest jewelry, and which has a great pride in itself. And inside, it is nothing. There is nothing there but surface. Now, this is something that ultimately will destroy the body, because surface alone leads to dissipation. The body is a useful purpose. It is there for us to use. If we abuse it, we suffer. If we use it, we gain a great deal of help and cooperation from it. But the, the body is not to be intended as the ruler of the life. The body is not to be taken as proceeding in authority or in purpose all the rest of our existence. We are not here to be servants of the flesh. We are not here to devote all our waking time to trying to develop muscle or brawn. We are here to use the body as we would use a good vehicle. If we have a good car, we will keep it up because we need it. In the old days, we had a horse and buggy. We fed the horse well so that it was properly curried and stabled in order that it might fulfill its purpose. But gradually in this modern world, we have developed the, the famous paint sign motto, Save the surface and you save all. Most people kill themselves trying to save the surface. So use the body, but decide how to use it. And uh, recognize that in the conservation of energy, that the complete uh, cooperation between the body and the person in the body is necessary to energy conservation. We have to plan our lives. I suppose Muhammad was one of the best life planners that we know. He divided the 24-hour rule of the 24-hour of the day, the 24-inch rule, into three eight-hour sections. One he gave to the world to help and to carry on his ministry in order that his labors might be of service to God. The second, he was, the second eight hours, he devoted to his family to his personal happiness and growth, to enjoying the reasonable and proper pleasures of life. And the third uh, eight-hour period, he, uh, he gave over to sleep, relaxation, and rest. Now, this is not a bad type of division. We would have many more healthy people if we had the three divisions of time into eight hours. Today we have very little problem with the eight hours of work. We had a little work done not long ago by uh, some tradespeople who came in to work. We didn't have to worry about them overworking, I can assure you. <laughs> they were working by the day. They arrived at 10 o'clock in the morning and left at 3 in the afternoon. Certainly this gave them plenty of energy uh, to uh, do something else with. They did not have to work from dawn to dark as we used to in the older days. They did not have to go out and milk three or four cows before breakfast. They had a great deal of time, and eight hours devoted to business, transaction, 
to career, to employment, is almost an actual uh, law today. Anyone works more than that gets overtime. So the eight hours for work, or for service, or to go out and do the things that help others, or to variously contribute to the well-being of the community, these possibilities fit well into the eight-hour period. Now, the eight hours of sleep, this is a little different, but we still mostly abide by it. And while we are asleep, we don't waste very much energy. But in sleep, we also have a breaking down of the wear and tear of the day, and if the waking hours have been well used, the sleeping hours will be reasonably efficient. Sometimes we have difficulties, everyone has them, but for the most part, we'll be able to keep that eight-hour span pretty well. The work is right because we're using the energy that is given to us for work. The rest is right because we are using it to relax and restore the energies. The big problem is the remaining eight hours. Here we have the eight hours to do as we please. Here are the hours of self-improvement, rest, relaxation, study, pleasure, family, friends, children. And I would say that this group of eight hours is in miserable condition at the present time. Our idea now of eight hours of happiness and pleasure is television. Here we sit and watch murders for eight hours and uh, also occasionally get a brighter moment from a commercial. <laughs> also, uh, if we are not doing that, we are doing all kinds of wasteful, useless things. We are going out and drinking too much. We are keeping up a social life that doesn't mean anything. We are possibly uh, indulging in the narcotic culture. Or perhaps we are simply sitting around uh, fussing, reading the newspaper, worrying about the world, and uh, very largely ignoring the better type of life. We are not giving the children proper attention, we are not giving the family proper attention, nothing is falling apart. Now this is where the part of our psychic integration, which corresponds to the seven planets or the soul section of man's triune nature, of spirit, soul, and body. It is the soul structure which is the part that is giving us the great trouble. Here we have conflicts, we have confusions, we have ambitions overruling common sense, we have the gratification of sensory perceptions without end, we have a tremendous struggle for luxuries, we are afraid to economize. We want to try to maintain a level of economics that is falling apart underneath us, and we are not doing anything with that eight-hour period, which is perhaps one of the most important of our entire life. We make a living in one eight-hour period and throw it away in another. We work hard to get something, and when we get it, it's no good to us. So we have to take this psychic area of our uh, eight-hour period and try to see what we can do uh, to use it to reorganize our energy resources, to keep ourselves from wasting the energy that we ought to be building up. We eat in order to live, and then we turn around and live only to eat. Everything gets into trouble. It gets too much of everything. So in this eight-hour period, what we are supposed to do is to develop the overself, to provide the life with steering gear, provide it with motives, provide it with opportunities to grow, to become better human beings and to become more significant human beings. In the sleeping period, we are little better than vegetables. We are sound asleep. In the working period, we're a little bit uh, than draft animals because we are laboring. These are the two things that have to be more or less handled. But in this other part, this other third, our humanity can take over. And it is especially important that our humanity does take over if we bring to bring, wish to bring a solution to any of the problems of modern living. Unless we make 
that part, that eight hour of rest and relaxation, very important. We're never going to get out of the present problem. We should use at least a good part of that in quest for basic self-improvement. We should study, we should think, we should develop talents. This eight hour period is the opportunity in our lives to bring something forth out of ourselves. This is the part that is ourselves. Here is our chance to be ourselves. We are not John Smith while we're working. We're not John Smith while we're sleeping. But we're John Smith when we take hold of our lives and build a personality for John Smith. To make him an important person. To make him gradually unfold the resources so that when he leaves this world, he will be better and not merely older than when he came here. To go out of this world at the end of 70 or 80 years, knowing no more than when we entered, starting out by wanting to be wasteful and dying wasteful, actually beginning life full of opinions and dying with the same opinions or others just as bad, this is a complete loss of life. It is a, a very interesting uh, situation because something was brought to my personal attention, a little story on me. Uh, many, many years before the war, I inherited a Japanese houseboy. I inherited him because I kept held him for a couple of months to help me. Then I told him I couldn't afford to keep him, so he said he'd stay without pay. It was a beautiful arrangement. But I was working very hard, writing and lecturing out a great deal of the time, and my library at that time was in my home. So one evening I come home, and here is Asa, my houseboy, sitting on the edge of a fireplace in the living room, with my choicest books piled up in front of him, and a beautiful fire burning in the grate. I said, what are you going to do, Asa? He says, I'm just going to burn them. I said, they're not yours. He said, I'm burning them. Well, they belong to me. He said, you won't be here to enjoy them. And he gave me a good solid talk on why it was that if I didn't ease up a little bit, there'd be no use to have anything. That if you become dominated by some situation that prevents you from being able to ventilate your own life, you will ultimately get into trouble. So it is very important that eight hours of doing the things that enrich life. One way, I think, is to realize that in this area we have the whole field of the arts, creative self-expression. Now, arts, of course, here's where a little spot where I think the lunar factor comes in. That part of the solar energy, which has to do with art, also bounces off of the moon occasionally and produces what we call today, uh, so we say, post-impressionism art that you can't do a thing with, art which does not have within it one bit of psychic life. It does not help you to grow, it does not express any creative conviction, and very often is motivated entirely by commercialism. There you're wasting your energy, but you have to place your own censorship on this energy and the use of it. But creative art is very important, music is important. Through the study of philosophy, the individual gains a great deal. He gains even more, perhaps, by spending more time with his children. Everything is important which helps him to grow, instead of merely to become richer or more powerful, or to shorten life by bringing about an impending coronary. So the eight hours in which we should do as we please and have time is probably the great testing time of our, of our daily existence. If there is anything that is involved in the initiations into the ancient mysteries, it was the study of time. Cronus, the great god of time, uh, with his sickle and his hourglass. Cronus was the symbol of all devouring time, all absorbing time, and time finally drawing back into itself everything that came from it. For it is said of, this, of Cronus that all of his, he ate all of his own children. 
because he devoured everything that existed within the sphere of his existence. Time is terribly important to us. Time is also something in which we can grow. Time is that period in which we can take over personally the affairs of our own inner lives. We can think, we can share beauty, share knowledge, do all kinds of interesting things that help us to become something. Time should draw something out of us. It should not be a period which we have to fill out of any contrivance that comes along because we cannot endure our own acquaintance. Most people, the moment they have a minute of time, try to find some way to waste it. This is not the answer. Another group spend that time trying to figure out how to cheat their neighbors. That's not the right answer. The real purpose of time is to realize that this is that part of life which we pay for by education, we pay for by labor, by responsibility, by effort, in order that in that period we can be ourselves. And if we are truly ourselves, we will be rather quiet, collected people. We will also have interesting avocational interests. We will find life an inspiration. We may turn to some special field of arts or sciences. I know several persons who have become very celebrated in botany as a result of having time. Another individual had time and did other kinds of things. So Walter Raleigh had time while he was in the Tower of London waiting for execution. And during that time, he wrote his History of the World, which is one of the greatest documents of literature. Everyone can do something with time. And that something is to use it quietly. Time moves silently with mysterious tread. It is something that we can use to become ourselves, to discover the real being that is locked in us, and in so doing, begin to appreciate ourselves. And when we realize why we are here and what we are here for, we do not become egocentric, but we do become aware of the responsibilities that we owe ourselves, that we owe ourselves in energy, on time, and in relationships with people. Everywhere there is the temptation to make poor use of these resources. Now in world conditions, time is becoming a great vital factor in health. There is a, a great deal of sickness arising today from simple fear fear and tension and stress. We are disturbed. We are annoyed. We are frightened. And above all other things, we seem to see hovering over us somewhere in the abstract atmosphere the constantly increasing danger of nuclear war. We are worried about pollution. We are worried about natural resources. We are trying to defend endangered species. Perhaps we don't realize it, but at the moment man is the most endangered of all species because he is killing himself. He is poisoning the water he drinks. He is adulterating the food he eats. He is abusing the body he lives in. And he is attempting to find happiness by keeping away from all of the truth that would give him any security and peace of mind. So he is in trouble. Now, people who are more studious and more thoughtful uh, uh, and are really trying uh, must also take this uh, dimension of the problem into, into consideration. They must realize the tremendous importance of getting their minds off of things they cannot do anything about. This does not mean that you should not be aware of these things, but you are going to all have to learn ultimately to take them as you would study history. They are facts that have to be accepted. They are mistakes that are being made. There are tragedies which are likely to follow. But there also is no way or no profit for any individual to devote his life to fear and anxiety concerning things he can do nothing about. If he can do something about them, he should do it. But to simply sit back 
frightened to death every day by the newscast, is of no value to himself, it is destroying his health, it is reducing his efficiency, and it is gradually corrupting him to the point where he begins to agree with all of the, uh, the false rumors and beliefs and teachings that are annoying him from day to day. So we have to build a defense against this. We have to build a defense, and here we have to go back to what the world has been worrying about for a long time. It is gradually dawning on a great many people that in our great hurry to prove how great and wonderful we were, I mean, an effort to cultivate the tremendous progress in density which we, we have come to be accustomed, we have forgotten that the one factor in our consciousness by means of which we can handle a situation of this kind is faith. This is the spiritual sun. Wisdom is the sun of the soul. Health is the sun of the body. And faith is the sun of the spirit. So the uh, faith factor is the supreme energy factor of all. There is nothing in the universe that strengthens as much as faith or allows strength to flow through it. And there's nothing that weakens the uh, human being or any social structure than lack of faith. And all fear arises ultimately from lack of faith. So in our problem of straightening out our energy resources, it is necessary for us to begin to put together the structure of the universe and realize that we are part of something that is forever changing. We are part of a process in which mistakes are inevitably being corrected, even though painfully that the great stream of life is moving toward the inevitable victory, and that in a universe which is suspended from pure spirit, material things can never actually take over. The uh, individual who tries to make them take over is buried with his ancestors. All of the great despots have gone down to a common earth, and there's one a poet said years ago, it is interesting to imagine that on the grave of Caesar, violets grow. And they probably grow perhaps off of the very fertilizer of Caesar. All power, all of this great pump and panoply goes. And the thing that remains is man's motion toward the fulfillment of himself the fulfillment of his real destiny, which is not to be bigger, stronger, and more powerful than his neighbor, but to be more and more right in the light of truth and in the facing of the problems of existence. <coughs> it is actually very definite that in this problem we have a new way of building peace of mind and conserving resource. Save your energy by faith. Now they say faith without works is not very beneficial, but faith has its own works. And where faith leads, the works follow. The works are not a substitute for faith, but they are suspended from it as from a glorious principle in space. Faith in its, its own way it prevents us from so many false judgments. Uh, almost all of our antagonisms in life are based upon the fact that others have injured us. Faith tells us that this is not true, that none of us can suffer from the deeds of others, but we can suffer from our own reaction to those deeds. If someone has despitefully used us, we can follow the methods of Khomeini and start a holy war. Or we can follow the advice of Christ to do good to those that despitefully use us. If we do good, we relax. There is no common penalty. To do good is to achieve good. To do anything else is to achieve that other thing. While Buddha was preaching in India, in the state where he was born, Kapilavastu, 
the general of the armies came to him and said, Master, I am the defender of the state. It is my duty to protect you and all of the people of this state. And yet to to do this, I may have to have war. I may sometime have to turn upon others. I must lead armies. I must take all the responsibilities for protecting the obligations I have taken. What is the answer, Master? What should I do? The Buddha said, you should do that which is to be done. If you are the leader of the armies, then you yourself must be prepared for the karma. This karma is according to motive, according to the situation that involves, but one thing is certain. Any man who is the general of the armies must be ready to die himself in battle. He must recognize that it is his destiny by karma, if he raises the sword, he will be struck by the sword. But if he raises the sword in the defense of principles, there is another karma that comes in also, the karma of the integrity behind his motive. He may, this integrity will not prevent him from being killed, but in the great plan of things, it will be added to his integrities. Therefore, whatever you have dedicated yourself to do, that you must do. But remember, every dedication has a consequence. Every decision has a result or an effect. Every single attitude that we hold has an attitude de dependent upon it. Every time we are angry, we are also creating inharmony. We are creating waste and loss. We have to say to ourselves, is there righteous indignation? The answer is that righteous indignation is actually perfect quietude. There is no other kind. Righteous indignation tells us that we have a right to be angry. If so, we must face the fact that others have a right to be angry at us. In nature, everything is compensated. Everything is worked out with absolute justice and mercy. Actually, we are growing, and all this dissension and fussing, all this fear and anxiety is part of man's resistance to growth. The growth comes anyway. Whatever happens, the growth will be the ultimate reward. When we cooperate with growth, we grow with it. When we oppose it and fight it, we build a karma of opposition and fighting within ourselves. So our energy resources tells us that if our faith is great enough, in order to maintain inner peace, that we can then face all change with a good hope. We can face all the situations of life without anxiety, without fear. We can do what is necessary with perfect calmness of spirit. This is only possible, however, if we add maybe something else to it. Faith is a wonderful thing. In fact, it is absolutely necessary. But how does one develop faith? It's a little difficult for the average person to say, I can totally accept the situation that I do not understand. How can I have faith when I see nothing but misery around me and the wrong people always seem to be winning. How can I have faith when it looks as though the future is clouded with a darkness beyond our comprehension? So Plato came to the answer to that particular question very simply. He said in order to have faith, you have to use the mind. You have to use the reasoning power to protect faith rather than to tear it down. In other words, you use the rational power to prove that the true is true and not in a desperate effort to prove that the untrue is true. The purpose of reason is to become aware by study, by thought, 
of the great rules, laws, and principles that sustain life. This is philosophy. And philosophy is the handmaiden of faith. And as Plato himself said, the only end of learning is that it shall sustain and justify faith. But faith has to be justified for most people. They have to understand something of the world, something of life, something of the powers and pressures going on. They have to become aware of the grand scheme of things. They have to become more conscious of the great integrities by which all things exist. Science can give faith because it can give certainties. It can give such evidences of the realities of universal laws that it's almost impossible to doubt them. But we also have to have that kind of justification, that philosophical justification, <laughs> that enables us to take something like a universal law which is applicable to physics or astronomy or biology and put it into our own psychological integration. We have to find in our own way, through wisdom, through learning, through study, the grand scheme of things. Now where will we look for it? All through the world, from the beginning of time, there have been persons curiously endowed who seemingly have a closer comprehension of values than other persons. In the rather confusing vacation that I just went into and out of, we went down to Sedona in Arizona and I kind of revived my contact with a lot of the Indian life there and found something very interesting. Since I had been there many years ago, an entirely new group of young Indians have come up. And these young Indians have gone back in their own records. They've gone back to the ancient legends of their ancestors. And they've taken those legends and thought about them instead of laughing at them. Instead of thinking how stupid their ancestors were or why it would be impossible for a primitive Indian sitting on the top of a mesa to make a major contribution to knowledge, they began looking into these things to find out what the old ones were believing. And the old ones were dying out pretty fast. Not many of them left. And some of these old ones did not want to die until they had left the story of what they knew to somebody. They had been more or less sworn to secrecy. But now they wanted somebody to know so they shared this knowledge not only with their own younger people, but with an occasional Anglo, being a term for non-Indian. This uh, peculiar circumstance has led to some interesting discoveries. Among the Hopis, for example, uh, the question came up of what came first? What was the first thing? Now these people can't read or write. They've never been to school. Their knowledge comes only from the old ones who went before them. So they asked one of these old men, says, uh, what, was very, what was the very first? And he said the very first was space. Going on forever. An infinite area. On and on and on and on. Everything, everywhere, all over, full of space. And... Uh, where, what, what happened then? All life came from space. All life came when the seeds were sowed in space. And who sowed the seeds? God. And who guarded this? God. And how was it all handled later? God picked wise men, taught them, and gave them the leadership and told them to instruct the people. And step after step you went along until you did not know whether you were in Hopi land, India, China, Japan, or Greece. The same teaching. The same principles. The same realizations. The same beliefs. The same integrities. The same requirement of initiation into the tribal rights in order to prove merit and worth. In many tribal peoples, a young person is not a citizen by birth. 
this idea of citizenship by birth wasn't known much by the ancients because it didn't fit. And why didn't it fit? Because nobody can be right by accident. And no one can be wise by birth. No one can be proved to be a good citizen simply because he was born. So when the time came to decide about who should be a citizen, the young person, man or woman, was initiated into the tribe. They had citizenship bestowed upon them. The milk name was taken away from them and they were given a grown-up name. And from that time on, they weren't children anymore. And as grown-ups, what were they expected to do? The answer was simple. Dedicate their lives to the good of their people. What were they to do for themselves? Only that which they could do without injuring anyone else. What were their duties to the family? When they went hunting, the first game should be brought to the widows and the fatherless. What did they do for exchange? They had no money, no currency, whatever. There was no profit in the system. When one of them was to had an argument with another, what did they do? They dug a hole, and they told the two of them to talk their argument into the hole. <laughs> then they said, fill up the hole and shake hands. And that ruled America for hundreds of years before a white man got here. We know the answers to these things. We know what's wrong. But we're just not very interested. But if we're not more interested, they're going to get more and more wrong. And the more wrong they get, the more tired we are going to get. And we won't have money enough to pay the doctor's bills. We will not have sufficient energy to learn anymore. So we will try to forget. We will try to ignore everything and slip into the grave as painlessly as possible. Even the Indian knew it wouldn't do any good, simply because he knew perfectly well in his own heart and mind that when he slipped into the grave, he was still there. He was still alive. He still knew right and wrong. He still had to face his own deeds. And in most American Indian communities, he was going to be reborn back and live it out. They believed that. So that the Indians gradually have revealed a lot of interesting things to us. The healing methods by which we are to overcome most of the diseases are based entirely upon a very complicated religious ceremony. And in this religious ceremony, before it is over, the cure is due to the fact that the individual restores his faith in the plan. He becomes aware that health comes from space too. He realizes that it has to be earned. We have no right to be healthy unless we deserve it. And in the great Yebachai and the medicine ceremonies and so forth, the uh, person has his consciousness of social citizenship restored. While he is on the sand painting, he is one with the universal life of things. He shares again in the great laws of his people. He calls upon the great spirits of the people. He makes new obligations to himself. He rededicates his life to useful purposes. And while the chanting goes on and the drums roll and the rattles are rattled, he gradually re regains his citizenship in his own tribe, something that was taken away from him in many instances where foreigners coming in would not let him even have his own language. But when he became again well-adjusted member of his own society, living in the laws of his own society, living in the mesas and in the cliffs, living in the deserts upon the simple fare that he gained there, sharing with those of his tribe and kind the, the lot of life. When he began to understand these things, he got well. He became a well-adjusted citizen of his own people. 
and in so doing fulfill his destiny. He could not have done it without faith in the, in the old ones, <coughs> the Manados, the great teachers who had gone before, the Sky Lodge. All these things had to be in his consciousness or he couldn't do it. If we don't want today to gain security under the pressures of present conditions, we need a, a strong and abiding faith. A faith has been given to us and we've got to keep it. Our religion, which has been gra gravely neglected, is the most powerful instrument for our salvation that there is, not just theologically speaking but in terms of putting back into this world a social order in which it is possible for the individual to live according to his own inner convictions. The spirit power of the first son in us is true, right, rejoicing in righteousness. When we live according to the divine plan, we will live. When we break it, we will die. When we keep the rules, they will keep us forever. But unless we have an understanding of something bigger than ourselves, something more, more worthwhile than the little accumulations to which we are dedicated, unless we have a purpose nationally, internationally, racially, culturally, a purpose to build something that is going to endure, build up on dedication, self-sacrifice if necessary, martyr them if need be, but build toward an eternal pattern of securities. Unless we are willing to be, know that we are here to do something, we won't do anything. And not doing anything important, we do all kinds of things to hurt each other and ourselves. But if we once gain an insight into the plan of things and realize that we were created to help to fulfill that plan, we are intended to roll up our sleeves and be part of this great program of righteousness. When we understand that, we can do something about it. And if we can't do very much about it because of conditions around us, then we have to know that by virtue of conditions within us, that no one who tries can fail, that no one who makes a good effort can escape the reward for that effort. We are eternal. We have been here before. We'll be here again. It goes on and on. The virtues that are not rewarded now will in due time be rewarded. But the vices which we think we have evaded, they will be back also. We will have the perfect right to recognize that out of a great cycle of embodiments, we have one lifetime. A lifetime that, from that goes from the cosmic cradle to the cosmic grave. The lifetime in which we are all growing up. And in this lifetime, it is very necessary that we learn the rules so that we can use our energies, use our strength, use our powers, and use our skills to advance a common end. The reward for this is peace. The reward for this is a civilization that can endure. And it also, in a more personal way, rewards us with better family conditions, better community life, and better health. Because the, the dedications to common good help digestion and do all the various remedies uh, a great service. For a remedy may be partly effective because of its own virtues, but it is more effective if it is used to accomplish a, a real and sovereign good. The whole problem of energy, therefore, is to use it right, use it skillfully, use it honorably, make sure that it is not wasted, because it's just as true of energy as anything else when Ben Franklin said, waste not, want not. We are wasting every day our resources, our time, our energies on things that are not important. And for that reason, the important things are going to the dogs in front of us. So we have to try, each person, try in your daily living, try in balancing your budget, try in shopping, to be thoughtful, quiet, conscientious, and honorable. 
and uh, deal as far as possible only with others of the same kind. But always remember never to fret, never to fuss, never to get all excited and unhappy and perturbed and annoyed. All that is just plain waste of time. And he who wastes time wastes himself and wastes the eternity of which he is a part. I think it's very good to, to think of the idea that is beginning to come back to us from the past, namely, uh, that this civilization, this pattern of things, had a keynote. It had a destiny. A civilization that rises is a great center for the diffusion of energy. The American people have been known for centuries for the tremendous resourcefulness of energy. The dedications that were made by our early founding fathers were enormous. The labor of building this nation day by day, year by year, of building it together, of creating an organized place which was to become a refuge for millions of persons in distress and sorrow in all parts of the world. This nation had a reason for existence. That reason has slowly faded away from the average member of society. He no longer thinks of it anymore. He is no longer aware of the fact that his country is a dedication, that there is some reason why he should rebuild or restore the original purpose. For out of the corruption of other countries, we sought to build a clean country. We cannot allow the corruption of that country to cause it to join the corruptions of the ages that have faded away. We are now in danger of doing the very thing that we created this nation to prevent, avoid, and escape. We have changed aristocracies, but we still have them. We have complete lack of dedication to the great good for which we were intended. Now it may be that some of us still feel that way. We have that dedication. And more will have it every day because it's coming back and coming back very fast. But with this dedication we will use our energies day by day in what ways we can to be of more use, more value, more friendliness with other people. And in so doing we will build a destiny. And sometimes, somewhere, all those who labored together to make it a better world will have that better world. And little by little, the corruptions that have failed to achieve anything will fade out. We have to start. Religion gives us faith. Wisdom strengthens our religion. Labor glorifies both faith and wisdom. And also, all of these together provide the proper, normal use for energy. And we are more or less reminded of the Eucharist, which is probably one of the most sacred uh, symbols of Christianity. This is my blood, said Christ, which has been sacrificed for you. This blood is life. Christ becomes a symbol of the spiritual Son. The rays of that sun are the blood of life. And in ancient times, the sun was shown with drops of blood pouring from it. In early Christianity, the Lamb of God was shown with the seven wounds. And there were the seven wounds in the breast of the Mother of Mercies. The blood of life is energy. The right use of energy is the most important dedication that there is. There can be no religion apart from the recognition that the life upon which we live is sacred. The energy that makes that life is a responsibility and that everything that happens all the way along, we are living in the midst of sacred matters which we cannot profane without inevitable tra uh, tragedy. It is absolutely necessary for us to look upon the universe as the body of a divine being and every cell and every atom of that universe must be treated with respect 
treated with, if necessary, with veneration. And every energy, every utility, every element, every substance that we have should be used prayerfully and used sincerely and with the greatest sense of obligation because all these things are part of the body of the divine power in which we live. And those that misuse this power are abusing life and abusing the great principles which were given to us to make our own way happier and better. So let us remember that energy is the blood of the sun shed for us and that it is our responsibility to use that energy for the common good of each other. Well, I guess better quit now.